button now? Yeah. Do we have sound now? Let me know. Cheryl, Mary Ellen, Carmen, <laughs> let me know if we have sound now. Okay, cool. All right. Yay. Happy November. Welcome to our live chat on the November, which will be the last November we have this year. <laughs> okay, so let's get started uh, just with the housekeeping details as folks begin to come in. Uh, you know how it works that everybody is invited to join us, but to ask questions, you have to be a Studio Insider member. That sounded really um, a little bit uh, exclusive, but we don't mean it to be exclusive. It's just a way to make it possible to answer the questions as they come in. If we don't have that kind of restriction, the the chat box will be going so fast we won't even be able to see the questions. So anyway, uh, Studio Insiders ask the questions everybody else wants. And if you're watching and you're not a studio insider, well, maybe you know one and you can shoot a text to them and ask them to ask your question for you. Uh, so today's, today's um, discussion is going to be around, around that most important concept of emphasis. Uh, to, not just emphasis as, as a single thing, but the degree to which we emphasize in order to uh, allow the viewer to see where we want the viewer to see, to guide the viewer's eye, where we want the viewer's eye to go, the whole concept of emphasis and what that means and how that can play, how that does, whether you mean it or not, it does play such an important, important role in your painting. So uh, this is what we're going to be doing. So what we'll do is in just a moment we will uh, play uh, a little video that I did for you ahead of time to get you going and get you focused on the concept of emphasis and what it means. And then after the video, we will open the chat box up for discussion, taking questions from our members. All right. Uh, do we need, have anything else we need to... Uh... That's right. Okay, that's good. I'm up to speed now. We're up to speed. <laughs> I like being up to speed. Sorry about that little sound glitch at the beginning. Um, that's just something. We were experimenting ahead of time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I hope you haven't heard what Roger said. <laughs> okay, are you ready with the video, Roger? I'm ready. All right, let's get started. Let's play that video. Uh, listen closely. Save your questions until after the video, and then we can answer every question, and you can give full attention to the video itself. Okay. Roll that video. It's the painter that influences how the viewer sees the work by the way we place the degrees of emphasis. Emphasis is caused by something being different. It might be a difference in color. It might be a difference in edges. It might be difference in texture. It might even be difference in direction. It could be a difference in size. All our visual elements have the ability to be different from each other, and that difference attracts attention. And the degree to which we attract that attention creates emphasis. Now, if you look at this blank screen I have here, I'm going to attract your attention. You see, I didn't attract your attention strongly, but I did make a change. And any change is going to attract the attention somehow. How close that change you make is to other things will determine to, to what degree the attention is being attracted, and that's what we mean when we say degrees. Now, let's play a little game here. So you see I attracted your attention there, but it's not holding your attention very long because the contrast there is so very close. Same color, same everything, a round disc that is just a little bit lighter than the area around it. Now what if I do this? You see, contrast there is much stronger. So this strong kind of contrast, this is value contrast, will get your attention quicker. Now let's try something else here. Notice what your eye does now. It goes over to the other disc, 
But it's going to come back to that stronger one because of the stronger value contrast. What about if I do this? We have one now that is in between in the way of contrast. It's a little bit darker than the brightest one and a bit lighter than the darkest one. And you can see there we've got three different degrees. Now what is actually happening to the eye is the eye hits this first. The eye might want to go here next and then come here. But the eye will roam among these three because they are all different from this. We can't always be totally aware of that. But that's why we are aware of what we do that gets attention in our paintings. We can already see that we've not changed the kind of shape. We've not changed the size of the shape. We've only changed and not changed the color. We haven't changed the texture. Uh, we've only changed the value, and we've created a direction by the way we've aligned these. Now let's do something different. See, what we've done here is we've changed the size. Now it really gets our attention, because it's, uh, so it's larger than the other two discs, and so our eye is really going there. All right, how about this? Now what happens? We have some competition. But because the value contrast of the larger one I just created is not quite as strong as this value contrast is here, we still are being drawn more strongly like this one, just like gravity. So now we know that size can influence the degree to which we create emphasis. Even though this one is much larger here, it has a closer value contrast than this one does. This one being even smaller, but with a stronger value contrast, still is pulling our eye to it more strongly. Let's try something else. Now I have repeated the contrast, and I've repeated the kind of shape. I've made it a little bit smaller. And you can now feel this gravitational pull between these two. Let's do a little bit more. Now we've given an even stronger gravitational pull to this one right here because we've made the contrast stronger between this one and this one than we have this one and this one. So these two now are leading the eye back and forth between the two. We can still feel now this one being lighter is feeling more contrasted because of the darker one beside it. Uh, being being closer in value than this area in here. So you see we can play that game and we've also changed sizes. So the variation of sizes can call attention to things. Uh, in other words, we can change the degree of contrast by changing or uh, varying sizes, making some sizes smaller or making them larger. But we mix things up. There's, we can have as many images as we want or as few as we want, like Richard Schmidt has done here. Lots of different kinds of emphasis all over the place, different degrees of emphasis. Let's explore here what visual element plays the strongest role in creating degrees of emphasis and what other elements can also be used to create degrees of emphasis. This is a value scale. Every value we see on any value scale corresponds with values we see all around us. So if we superimpose the value scale over Schmidt's painting, we can move that scale around and look through these little holes here, or we can compare the edges of the scale, and we can see we can identify values. All right, so for example, if I'm in this area right in here, and I superimpose the scale. I'm seeing that this area right in here is within this value range. It's more this value, 9, than it is this value, 10. You can see it's a little lighter than value 10. In other words, there is a close value relationship between this value and this value. Then we see another value change right here. But now just squinting at that, we can see that is lighter. It may be an interval and a half or two intervals lighter than the ones around it. We can see there's, it's still very close. 
And as we continue to scale these values right across in here, you can see that the values of this and this, these two together, are further apart. We can see this value as very far apart from the values on this side around it, not quite so far apart from this value. Now that's what we mean about degrees of value contrast. Now why is that important? Because it's the degree of the contrast of the value contrast is one really, really strong element that our behavior of an element that creates emphasis. Now let me prove that for you. So even though this figure is closer to us, we see a really strong emphasis here and here. And we really see a stronger emphasis on the figure's neck here because of that value contrast. Now if I take away the strong value contrast and leave only those closed value contrasts, maybe leave one strong value contrast, I want you to look at that very closely. Do you see the difference now? Do you notice what your eyes did, how your eyes responded when I took away those strong value contrasts? Now what do you see? Your, the strongest value contrast is in this area is right here on the girl's neck. And within the sky up here, there's a very strong value contrast. Notice how your eye goes there. Actually, if you close your eyes, look in this, and then open your eyes, and, and you'll notice your eye's going to go to that area first, and then your eye will register the whole scene. Now, I want you to notice when I add that back in, I want you to notice the difference in what your eye does, how your eye behaves. Let me reiterate, this is strong emphasis. This is a weaker emphasis. The degree of value contrast among these air, uh, images here are not as great as the value of contrast is here. And then if you look in other areas, the degrees of contrast are even closer. So the emphasis is here and in the sky. Now let's switch that back up. Now watch. You see, we have several areas that have a strong emphasis. And that strong emphasis guides the eye. This is more strongly emphasized than this is. This is a little bit closer value contrast. Not as many intervals between this value and those around it as between this value and this value are most of those on this side of that one, and between this value and this value. So we see that when we put that all the areas of emphasis back in, then the eye is guided to kind of circle and kind of a backward C the entire scene. We can look at this more closely and detect where Schmidt has de-emphasized uh, by pulling those degrees of value contrast closer and where he's emphasized by making the value contrast broader or wider or greater. So here we are. This is very much a part of the scene, plays a very strong role in the scene with its change in color, which I'll talk about in just a moment, with its change in color from what's around it. Uh, but the values are kept close, much closer than this value. So we see this area. Now when we isolate that, we find that this gets a little bit more emphasis down here. And then you notice how this leads the eye right up in here, with these being the contrast here being a little stronger than the contrast in other areas of just that one little section. All right, so let's take another one. Okay, you see what I've done there? I've isolated this little section right here. Now we can see, when I isolate it, we can see the, the degree of contrast. Now we can see that this is much closer in value than this area is here. When I throw this very strong value contrast behind it, do you notice how the interpretation of the whole area changes? But value contrast is, has a partner called color color contrast. And of course we know within color we have three ways to control the color. 
we control its hue, we control its value, and we control its saturation. But let's just talk about its hue. We, we do have a degree of emphasis here where this becomes red around this whole area of a perception of green. And then we see other areas that see uh, a low, low, low saturations of this same red. If you look, you can find it right in here. These are really repeated right over here and they are repeated over here. But the strongest saturation is right in here. So that's saturation of hue, and that is a kind of color contrast. The degrees of various kinds of color contrast, and the, the various degrees of value contrast. Then we can use those together to guide the eye and to create a painting where we create the expression we want by placing the emphasis where we want the emphasis to be. A very important companion to value contrast is edges for emphasis. The sharper the edges, the stronger the emphasis. Combine that with contrast, and we have another element. We can see it up here, too. Down here, we see that the edges are a little bit less emphasized, less sharp. Then when we scan throughout the image, we can see how edges have become very important. In this area, we see the sharper edges, but then if we look in other areas, we can see the edges softened, less emphasis. Softer edges give less emphasis. Even where the contrast is strong, if the edges are softer, we get less emphasis. Let's stop now and give you a chance to ask your questions. Okie dokie, folks. Ready for your questions. Questions about emphasis. You know, while you're getting your questions ready, I was thinking about, you know, there are recent uh, recording that the Beatles have done with uh, with John. Remember, uh, they had they had this uh, tape of John playing the piano and singing, but they and they tried to do a um, a recording with them playing along with the tape back in, I think it was in the 90s, but it wouldn't work because the piano was too loud and they had no way of separating the piano from his voice at that time. The piano was getting too much emphasis. You know, I love to equate music with painting and I think that's a really, really good example of what happens when there's too much emphasis. Uh, so there can be too much emphasis this is the reason we as painters, uh, um, it's a wise thing for us as painters to control where we where the emphasis is so that we can feature what we want the, the viewer to look at first. Cheryl has a question here. Just the three circles of the same of the same size, but different contrast was almost annoying because my eye knows uh, the other two were there but kept waiting, um, wanting to look at the white one until you put the other one. <laughs> well, you know, uh, if, if the oyster weren't annoyed, it would never make a pearl, Cheryl. <laughs> yeah, fortunately, we don't have that problem. Well, we shouldn't have that problem, but yet that kind of thing can happen if, you, if in your painting, uh, you don't have your emphases balanced. Uh, if you have too much, you know, a lot of people are just uh, uh, more focused on making the image look like itself. You know, that seems to be the thing for beginning painters, especially. Just want to just want to be able to paint those flowers or, or paint that uh, beautiful sunset or whatever it is to make it look like that. And how do I do that? And blah blah blah. Well, that's not the only thing. Uh, the, this this controlling of the contrast and uh, 
uh, varying degrees of the value of contrast, especially by all the kinds of contrast we put in, is going to determine how clear it is to see and whether you get irritated looking at it. Cheryl, does this mean we should have more than one emphasis working to draw the eye? Uh, I would say that depends on what the uh, that depends upon what the subject is and what is what the viewpoint is. Uh, we the emphasis, the quality of emphasis is going to pull the eye in. If you'll notice in the Schmidt's, he really had several points of strong emphasis, but they were arranged in such a way they were guiding the eye. And he had other emphasis, other uh, degrees of emphasis throughout the whole painting that enabled those to uh, uh, enable the uh, whole thing to work because the stronger emphasis weren't the only things we saw. And so, as long as we balanced it, we could have several areas of a, a relatively strong emphasis. Uh, but the important thing is that we have those in in an arranged in such a way that they are related to each other in a guiding the eye. And, and the other thing is so important is that we don't place the emphasis in places, I didn't mention this in the video, but we don't place the strong emphasis in places where the eye is just going to be pulled off the page. Uh, two examples I can think of that I saw recently, I, I'm not going to show those to you because uh, uh, because I don't really believe in showing you people's people's bad examples. Uh, I don't think that's a, a good policy, but I can tell you about it. I can describe it to you, and, and you won't have any idea who the artist might be if it's someone you might happen to know. But anyway, there is there in in a, in the publication of um, of, of a, a popular art magazine. Uh, there was an ad, uh, it had a beautiful painting, beautiful uh, waterscape, uh, creek bed, a uh, creek painting, painting of a creek, I should say. The, the technique was beautiful, everything was beautiful about it except for one thing, and that is that the major emphasis was the rushing water, the white rushing, uh, white, white of the water going off the left hand corner in a relatively large shape, which distracted because the value contrast, the contrast on either side of the white was darker. So it created such a value contrast there that the eye goes there and you talk about being irritated. <laughs> that creates a kind of irritation because your eye really wants to go back and explore the, the painting itself because it's so beautifully done. But that strong emphasis going off the corner like that uh, created that discrepancy that made it a problem, a visual problem. Another example I saw recently uh, was a, a, a landscape, um, a, a tree, a, a group of, a, a group of, uh, you might say, old oak trees that were done, and and it was apparently either probably probably late afternoon. Uh, when the painting was done, it was backlight, backlight meaning that the light source was behind the trees. So uh, all of the trees were in shadow. But the, the, the artist had put, uh, the range of trees so that there was a big bright area of sky on the extreme left going right off the painting. And the majority of the painting was, was uh, uh, occupied by those trees, the tree trunks and the foliage and whatever, with some light coming through the background. But when you look at it, it your eye wants to go right off the edge because that area of the strongest emphasis, and I'm sure the artist didn't really mean that, but that area of strong emphasis just took the painter right off. So this is why it's important that we uh, are uh, place that emphasis so that it doesn't take the eye off if it's a single emphasis, or if it's a group of areas emphasized, then it doesn't take the, the eye off and away from the painting, but it keeps the eye within the painting, and it's, it's sort of placed an entry point, if you will, uh, for the eye to go. So there, there is my little um, explanation of that. Uh, let's see, okay, that was the same question as me. Okay, how do you decide 
what the emphasis, how do you decide, Mary Ellen, how do you decide what to emphasize in the painting? Well, it depends on what, um, it depends on what the painting is. Uh, if you emphasize, well, first of all, uh, you look at what the, what, the, what, what the light source is doing, and, uh, and you emphasize according to what attracted you. Well, you're, first of all, you're developing your composition around what attracted you, what attracts you. But you, you, you place the emphasis where you would like the eye to go first, and then you build your uh, other degrees of emphasis around where your eye would like, where you'd like your eye to go first. Then there you got to be careful too. For example, suppose uh, again, suppose you have uh, a, a backlight. The light is behind. Oh, you could say what you're looking at is between you and the light source that places the back the light behind. Uh, but it's such a way that the light is not low down. It's sort of just up in the sky and behind. And it's also illuminating what's in front of you. Well, suppose you see this uh, beautiful oak tree. Suppose suppose you have something like a, a road leading in that direction. You see, and suppose you have this beautiful oak tree that's sort of in the distance. And, and yet it's in shadow. And, and so then if you place that oak tree in, in shadow right in the center and if you have that road leading to it and then you have all of that backlight around it then that uh, creates too strong of an emphasis that's like shouting at you because the eye gets stuck there you see so in that case what you would want to do when you, or you want to place that emphasis you want to shift that over and place and, and have uh, other things going on on one side or another so that the eye, so that the entire painting can uh, be uh, uh, encompass or lead the eye into that oak, rather than your eye going straight to it and be just feeling it's kind of like gravity when we have that strong emphasis. Um, there, as I said before, there it depends upon totally upon what your subject is, is where your emphasis is going to be. But generally, you're looking at where, what, it, what, what, where. What pulled you to it to begin with? Uh, was it just a piece of light somewhere, or was it uh, a certain uh, particular color, or is it uh, a particular image that really caught your attention? So that's going to be different for every, every painting. Um, okay, Rich asks, does including a human figure in landscape automatically create a strong emphasis that has to be dealt with? Not necessarily, Rick. If the figure is in shadow, for example, the Schmidt piece, for example, the Schmidt piece, the figure is actually in shadow, that her face is catching light, but uh, she's more in shadow. And so um, it doesn't, it, 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 she is important, but she's also important in the environment in which he put her, that environment of that old uh, graveyard, old cemetery. But it was the light that he, the way he was emphasizing the light that enabled the whole thing to work. So putting the figure in there, it all, dep all depends upon lots of stuff. But uh, let's say, how close do you want the figure to be? Uh, how close do you want the viewer to be to the figure? If you want the viewer to be very, very close to the figure, well, then you have made that figure the, the center of interest and then you would place your emphasis accordingly. But if you're looking in the distance at the, at the figure, or if the figure's in a part, of a, a part of a landscape that's in the distance, if the figure's in shadow, it might be something that you would, your eye would go to after you had already started viewing the painting. And so you control that. Remember, it's the painter who controls how the viewer sees the work. So you can control that according to how much emphasis you want to put on the figure and whether the figure is the most important or whether the figure is the uh, center of interest, the center of importance in the painting, or whether the figure is a part of what the whole painting is about. Um, Mary Ellen says, thanks, but what if the painting is abstract? I bet, <laughs> I bet you knew that question was coming. <laughs> yes, I did. I was waiting for it. <laughs> 
If the painting is abstract, that too is uh, dependent upon what the abstraction is doing. I mean, I can think of uh, the, all the different forms of abstract painting. It depends on who, what it's being emphasized. For example, if shape is being emphasized, uh, and say if shape is being emphasized, then what you want to do, if uh, what you want, if it's a contrast of shapes is being emphasized, then that's what you're that's what you're concerned about. You're in, concerned about the emphasis of the contrast of shapes. Then you, are how many ways can you contrast shapes and make the painting about the uh, make it the the painting about the contrast of shapes and which kind of kind of, why, where are you going to show that the strongest and uh, so that too is dependent upon the painting if the painting is about movements such as a, a, a Pollock painting a Jackson Pollock painting which was all about movement all about a dance that is about the movement in the painting and rarely you're going to see a real emphasis in his paintings so sometimes the the, the emphasis will be uh, pretty unique throughout the painting if the whole thing is uh, about a broader, if the whole, whole thing includes a broader theme. Uh, I'm also thinking about color field painters. The color field, field painters will have, uh, sometimes there will be a very subtle emphasis. You'll see uh, whole areas of color, maybe different colors, but in the same value range, for example, and then you'll see a tiny little slit of a, a stronger value but uh, or maybe another little slit somewhere else where the, uh, the stronger value will be kind of a point of emphasis. So there's a very broad area there, and I might even say that in abstract painting, uh, the, the emphasis idea or the, the use of emphasis is a, a much freer thing uh, than in, uh, well, I don't know, i got to be careful what I say there. It all, it all depends upon what the painting's doing, what the all depends upon what the intention of the painting is. And sometimes in abstract painting, the intention doesn't get defined until the painting is finished. So something to experiment with, uh, where, uh, where you're experimenting just with placing emphasis. You know, placing emphasis could very well be a theme of an abstract painting. And remember the different kinds of emphasis, that we, different ways to place emphasis. Value contrast is the major, as I said, the most major way of creating emphasis because even all the other ways of placing emphasis are dependent upon value contrast. For example, color. Yes, you can put a splash of color, of different color, amidst other areas, other um, kinds of color, uh, but if the value is the same, there won't be the emphasis there. You'll, it will be a, a minor degree of emphasis. Uh, if you look at the, if you look at the uh, leaf, the leaves, the fallen leaves behind me, you can feel an emphasis of the redder leaves. But if you squint at them and you look at them, you see that change in red. But you also see that the values are different between the redder leaves than they are the ones that are more the. Uh, the gold, uh, the brighter gold, brighter gold leaves are lighter, but they're in an uh, area of color that's more related, more related to them, and <clears throat> the redder ones are so different that they seem to be where your your eye kind of they, they they're the ones that are moving your eye around uh, more so. And I guess if I move my head, you might see it a little differently. See, something like that. But now, for example, see this area right in here. This is not so emphasized because the values are so similar, but the values are different right here. This is a very strong value contrast right in there. So the color will depend upon the value contrast as well, as well as the uh, saturation of the color. But the higher, sat the more saturated the color is, it's still got to have enough light for you to see that saturation. A color cannot be highly saturated I'll be, let me put this on though. In shadow, we don't see the high saturation, in a, especially in moderate to deep shadow. We just don't see that high saturation. We've got to have more light than that before we can see the high saturation. So you see, color even depends. We do use color for emphasis when we change a color or when we put different colors to get, uh, si uh, in, in relationship to each other. But, uh, uh, but the color depends upon the value. 
All of them depend upon the value. Uh, the texture depends upon the value. The textures, uh, the textures are are sh more textural and more busy. Uh, the more value contrast they have within them, the tiny, tiny little spots of value changes. But if they, if a texture has a very, very close value relationship, it won't have as much emphasis. And uh, the uh, direction is the same way. Uh, we can't see the direction without a, without a value change. Uh, size is the same way. You, you can't see the size without value change. Now, the size one I kind of illustrated to you in the in in the little video there, but the air uh, size. What did I name? I haven't, I haven't no fun even named all the values yet. But I'm trying to go. I mean the elements yet. But I was trying to go through the visual elements that cause us to see everything we see. Every one of them depend upon the value first. And so that's why value contrast is the strongest. Now the next strongest is the edges, the way we treat edges. Uh, the sharp edges with the strong value contrast are will get more emphasis than anything else. The, the softer edges reduce the emphasis. So you can have a strong value contrast with a softer edge and it won't get as much attention as the strong value contrast with the sharp edges get. So you see we've got all that stuff we can play with and isn't it fun to play with? Um, Rich, let's see who I'm do, 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 do. I, I, I got behind. I got behind, didn't I? I got to run in my mouth, I got behind. Okay, uh, well, did I hit Mary Ellen's thanks Diane, but what, oh yeah. Okay, here we go, Rich. The white, that white leaf stands out for being neutral amid all the colors. It really stands out because of this, yeah, being neutral among all the colors. It's part of it, you're absolutely right. But also, if you look at it, if you squint at it, you can see that it's it's got more uh, value contrast. Let me get over here. There we go. It's got more value contrast. Right, he's talking about this one right here. More value contrast than, than the rest of them. Uh, because you can see how they're dark around it there and how very, very light it is so yes indeed it's both those things it's the neutral among the color that emphasizes the contrast uh, as well as the value of contrast good observation rich um cheryl i keep going back to what you said before one seeing what attracts us in a scene in the first place two making a plan to emphasize that three be ready for surprises yes indeed I brought that out uh, in a recent workshop, this workshop we had last week with uh, that Cheryl was in, of, uh, yes, be always be ready for surprises. Because, you know, you, it, when you get in the middle, if you get in the midst of a painting, you might think you want your emphasis in one place. Once you get into it and the painting starts taking a life of its own, and, you know, then it, it might show you it didn't really want the real emphasis there. It wanted the stronger emphasis somewhere else. That's a surprise. So be be willing be be willing to accept surprises as a, a way of redirecting yourself to what the painting is actually doing and what's developing in the painting. All right, Mary Ellen, thank you so much. That's most helpful to the question. Oh, that's the most helpful answer to this question I've ever heard. Well, thank you, Mary Ellen. I must be on my oh what on my game today. Mm -hmm. I didn't say that quite right, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> is that on my game? Yes, on my game. <laughs> cool. Um, Ellen, what is the hierarchy then of emphasis? Top to bottom, uh, top to bottom is value edge. Oh, okay, top to bottom is value edge color size. I don't know that you. Could, I don't know that it'd be right to really give a hierarchy. I would say if there were a hierarchy, the value comes at the top. Because, not, when, not just value, not just value, but the degree of value contrast would come at the top, and probably the next underneath that would be edges first, edges before color. I don't know, there may be a discrepancy. See, someone would, someone would try to fight this out with me, so I wouldn't argue it because it's not, it's, not, it's not a dogma, <laughs> but uh, it's just a matter of, uh, of uh, do the softer edges are the, do the softer edges attract less attention than uh, than the more muted colors? So edges and color are very important to, but I think edges should really, 
uh, one thing that gets ignore, ignored the most. The way we uh, control our edges, the degree to which we are willing to soften edges and sharpen other edges in order to give that emphasis where we need it to be. Uh, so I think those, and beyond that, you couldn't really put a hierarchy there. There, I would say that uh, that beyond the value contrast, the soften, soft to sharp, that that range of softest, I mean, of a lost edge to soft edge, and then on to the sharpest edge, that sort of a continuum there, uh, that's is so very important. I put it right up there with value contrast because the two of those work together and colors right up in there with them. The rest of them, I would give them kind of equal, if I'm going to create a hierarchy, and I, I'm not really sure I want to, <laughs> But if I were going to, they would be the rest of them be kind of equal, Roger. It would depend on the subject as well. Oh yes, oh yes, good point, excellent. It will depend upon the subject, totally depend upon the subject. Yes. Uh, okay, where are we now? Okay, yeah. that was the hierarchy. What is the hierarchy then of emphasis yeah. talked about? Okay, yes. Just Color, size, size, and so. Thank you. Oh, good. That helps. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes that uh, people make rules that do more harm to our creativity and to our ability to grow as artists than they do good. And and any any of you who've studied with me or for a while know how I feel about rules. I, I think they're the worst thing they ever invented. Principles. Uh, the, I think it's more important to think of uh, all these things as uh, as action, active, active things, things that do stuff, things that do stuff because we do stuff, not this must be this or this must be that, but to also be able to recognize what do they do and what value contrast does, the stronger that contrast, it pulls us to it. That's what it does. So there we go. So, uh, Cheryl, let's see, where are we? Cheryl? Oops. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness, he's he's uh, overemphasized my chat box here. <laughs> All right, there we go. Even though texture is small value contrast, where would you use it for emphasis? Fur, bark, grasses, and so on. Tree bark. Tree bark. What? Oh, fur, tree bark, bark, grass. Cheryl, that depends upon the subject again. It depends upon the painting again. Uh, for example, uh, if I just take the the subject of grasses, for example. Uh, so I'm thinking right now of two scenarios where grasses are a big part of the subject. One would be a pasture, uh, and I would say a pasture, part of it's been, uh, um, part of the grass in the pasture has been mowed down by the cows and the goats, and another part of it has been fenced and it's all grown up. All right, so imagine that one, and then how about, uh, uh what about that, um, say a, a sea oats scene where we're looking through this we got sea oats, sea oats growing and we're looking through the sea oats into uh into the ocean uh all right now you see here we've got two different things going on there if you think about the sea oats scene the texture of those sea oats the texture that we create between the pattern especially at the bottom also the little oat heads at the top and so on like that uh, if we overdo that if we make those overly textured, then we're, it's going to look fake and stiff, and we're not the eye's going to get confused by that. So that would require that we would choose how we soften the edges of some of those oaks, how we would maybe blend the values into some of those shadow areas of, where we're looking through those oaks, and we need to decide where we wanted to give the ones the sharpest edges and the strongest value contrast in order to guide the eye, not have the eye to be confused by the bombardment of all that texture. Now, in the pasture scenario that I just described to you, um, so if, if the pasture, say if the pasture was your interest, or what was in the pasture was what your interest, I'm just coming up with ideas off the top of my head, I don't know where I'm going with it, but good, stay with me. Yeah. All right, so then if you get involved in giving all of the texture you see to those taller grasses over there, uh, then again, it's going to be the same problem as I just uh, described to you of the sea oats. 
Uh, so you need to decide what you're going to do with all that because if you're looking out of the pasture at those short mowed grasses, you know you may or may not see much texture, except as they're going. In, I mean, except as as they get closer to us, you may see a little bit of texture there. But that te the our uh, aerial perspective causes the uh, those uh, those grasses to get. Uh, they're so close together, it causes those grasses to get less and less texture as they move into the distance. So, um, makes me think of Christina's World. Christina's World is an excellent example. An excellent example. Check out Christina's World and how the Wyeth has handled the textures in the grasses there. So, yeah, it, you really, when you have lots of textures in a scene, you've got to be, you, you really have to, to really squint your eyes down and make decisions about how you want to to where you want those uh, textures to be emphasized where you want them to be sharper and where you want those them to be softened and maybe in some places sort of just uh, uh, blended into light and shadow uh, just patterns of light and shadow so you can see how that one's uh, uh, as well same thing with animal fur oh my goodness it, uh, if you uh, overemphasize the texture of an animal's fur, it's going to make the animal look fake. In fact, we don't really see it over, over overly emphasized when we look at an animal's fur. We'll see areas of the fur that are, uh, that are moving into light or mo uh, moving into shadow that get uh, the, where the textures are not really that visible. But the fact that where the light and shadow or where, it, where the light and shadow meet usually is where we're going to see the more defined textures of animal fur. But you see, when we define some areas of texture in things like fur, tree bark, I talk about that one too, same thing. When we define certain areas, we give clues to the viewer to assume that the whole area is made up of that pattern. But if we overly define every single part of that pattern, then we it, it flattens it out and and it goes fake. So that's true with tree bark, all the things that you mentioned, and everything else too that is made up of lots and lots of textures. So we we suggest uh, we define uh, in textures. We define by the again the it's the value contrast and uh, the value in accordance contrast and the sharpness of edges that that's going to define those textures in the areas where they're defined but we define only to the point that we can create the definition of what's there uh, the difference between animal fur and feather fur, feathers for example and we have to make decisions about that sometimes but usually in shadow areas you don't see the areas that defined or in very very light areas. Usually, you can look in those. You look in the areas where uh, in that in the transition areas where the light meets the shadow, or where there's a very low light or very shallow shadow. And those are usually where you're going to see the sharpest textures anyway. But still, the the task of the artist is not to over define. Marilyn. Um, Thanks for that question, Cheryl. The painting I'm doing for the workshop has a lot of rust and peeling paint. That's what attracted me. Diane, could you address this brief, briefly? Yeah, you can't even think of it as rust and peeling paint. <laughs> That's the result of, uh, we see it because of what the values and the, uh, uh, and the edges are doing. Uh, the values and the colors and the edges. There are certain colors there that are being developed by that rust, that are caused by that rust. There are values of the colors there that are caused by the uh, rust and, and the way the light's hitting it. You see them the way you see them now because of that particular light that's in that, in that reference source. But if the light had been in another location, if the sunlight or if the kind of light had been in another location, you would have seen them differently. So that's why we have to look at them, not for what they are, but we to see what are the variations in values and what is the sharpness of edges around those divisions of rust when that rust is popping off and turning up, for example. Look at the, look at the sharpness of the edges 
and look at the values, uh, what degree of value contrast is causing you to see that the way you see it. And then within that, you have the color variations that's causing that. So when you look at it like that, <clears throat> pardon me, when you look at it like that, when you look at images like that for what's causing you to see them the way you are, you're kind of doing kind of visual anatomy of the image itself. What's causing you to see them, see that image the way you do in terms of value contrast, uh, in terms of the sharpness of the edges, in terms of the colors you're seeing, then that will enable you, first of all, it kind of tells you what you need to do to create that. Uh, and so, um, okay, that I, did that do it, uh, Marilyn? Okay, Cheryl says, thank you, Diane. I forget about consciously thinking about using texture for emphasis. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, now you can remember it more often, huh? <laughs> uh, Alka asks, I'm doing a painting of dry leaves like the picture behind you, but the contrast are not so much. Wondering if it will work. Well, I don't really know. I think that depends upon you, Elka. Uh, if, if, if your photo doesn't have as much contrast as the one behind me, why? Ask yourself what's, what the, what's the light doing in that photo. Now, sometimes if we take photos in overcast light, they will not have, not sometimes, almost in, in, inevitably, when we take photos in overcast light, they won't have the degree of value conscious that we'll see in direct light source. We always go back to the light source. What is the light source doing to it? Because the light source is what causes you to see it the way you do. So ask yourself the question, first of all, is it in a, an indirect, is it overcast light? Is it late in the afternoon? or early in the morning, or uh, is, it, is there fog there? Fog can subdue the textures. You know, there are a number of things that can happen in nature to subdue, subdue the way a, a texture or an uh, emphasis of anything appears. So if you want your painting to have more emphasis, you start with having a, uh, I think it's a good idea to start with a reference that has in it the quality that you want in the painting. Else what you'll need to do is emphasize what you already see. For example, if I'm looking here at this little area right there, you see this little area of leaves right there is not as emphasized as this is. Why? That's the question you ask. What's causing it not to be emphasized? Well, if you look, it's uh, the values around it are very, very close. The value of the leaf itself is very, very close to that shadow value that's underneath it. And you don't see it as emphasized mainly because of that. Now, if I wanted that more emphasized, I could darken the shadow underneath it just a little bit more, and that would make it more emphasized. If I wanted to de-emphasize this one, I could do one of two things. I could either lighten the values around it, or I could darken its value and de-emphasize it. Another way I could de-emphasize it is by um, softening its edges. Softening its edges would help to de-emphasize it. So uh, the close, always look at it in terms of what the what values are you seeing. It does matter, not just the values in the areas. What what kind of value contrast are you seeing between one image and another, or between an image and the area that surrounds an image? We often forget to look at that negative space. Negative space is the space that surrounds an image, no matter if the negative space also is another image, which can become positive. He starts looking, look, I don't want to get into that. I don't want to get confusing. But anyway, look at it for what the value, look, look at it for the values you're seeing there. You can make it work simply by enhancing those values, or you might even raise the, uh, it, the saturation of values you see just a little bit, and that too might, uh, that too will help enhance it. Uh, Mary Ellen, I look forward to talking more about this tomorrow. Great. Okay, we'll do that. Um, all right. So, are there other questions now? Uh, while we're waiting for uh, other questions, well, here we go. Cheryl, Roger, 
Thank you, Diana and Roger, for giving us another great discussion. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> you knew where I was going with this, didn't you, Cheryl? Okay, let me remind those of you who are who have joined us but haven't are not or have joined our live session today, but are not yet uh, members of the our our channel. But uh, we call our members Studio Insiders. YouTube requires that we call you something, so we decided that would not be a bad thing to call you. Uh, so the membership of the channel simply does this for you. Uh, when you join as a channel member, then the one thing, you get a few little perks from us for being a member. That's where our, our, our way of thanking you for supporting us. And one perk that you get is exactly what you've seen today. You get the ability to ask questions during our monthly chats. We do this every month. The other, another thing that you get, which people really love, uh, is you get a free video. You get a free video lesson, an hour-long lesson, um, on our website dianemines.com. There are 170 painting lessons there, in in 40 different categories, 40, 40 different concepts being explored there, and and so with every month if you're a member you get one of those free we, we send you a, a private code that you can enter in at um, when you check out for one of those these are all downloads you download them you own them on your own computer or wherever so uh, and then the other we have three per three little perks for you and the other little perk is every second Sunday Roger sends you a little excerpt a little, a little, we call those those that way a little snippet. It's kind of like an Easter egg, right? It's kind of like an extended Easter egg. Is there such a thing as that? That is a terrible image, isn't it? <laughs> well, anyway, a little snippet. He'll send you a short little snippet from uh, from one of the videos or from one of the lessons. It's a little insight into what we do to do really uh, to to uh, to open up the possibilities as we're composing our painting. So we're right down here on the wire. And uh, oh, first, we did this chats begin and they end, and this one's about to end. So, I want to thank all of you for joining us. I uh, uh, hope that you have a, uh, those of you who are celebrating Thanksgiving, hope you have a happy Thanksgiving. We plan to ourselves, and we look forward to seeing you for our December chat. Yes, we will be having a December chat. Uh, we'll try to make it fun. In fact, we may have a little bit of an actual lesson where you can join us. So we'll talk, we'll let you know a little bit more about that closer to the time. That's going to be the third Sunday, Roger? Is that again in December? Is that too close to Christmas? I think so. It is the third Sunday, yeah. Okay, as far as we know, third <laughs> Sunday Christmas, we're going to see you again. So happy Thanksgiving, and thank you so much for joining us. So bye-bye for now.